today I am so excited to have my friend Ross Brand today on the podcast. Ross, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Valerie. It's exciting to be here. Yeah, well, you've had me on your show a couple of times here, uh, and it was really, I, I just really wanted to pick your brain a little bit because you are, in my eyes, like the king of live streaming, um, and with video and live streaming becoming such an important dominant force in the marketing space, I thought this is a great topic that so many people are curious about, they're thinking about, um, maybe they started to dabble in it and they just want to get better at it, but you would be the guy to give us all the amazing wisdom. So um, tell us a little bit about like, how did you get into doing live streaming and how had, did that become the dominant force in your business and in your brand itself? So I worked in radio as a show host, on-air personality, reporter, pretty much every, pretty much every on-air role you could have in news, talk, sports, radio. And I did that for 12 years. And I thought I was going to move on to other things. And in fact, I did for a little while. And then I stumbled into a platform called Blab and I kind of fell in love with live streaming again. And um, I fell in love with broadcasting again. This time it was live streaming. So live streaming in a lot of ways is like live radio because it's live, you have audiences coming and going. Yeah. Um, and the conversation's a big part of it. And I really enjoyed it. So instead of talking about what was the format of the station, I could talk about what interested me and who I was interested in talking to and things like that. And it just became a really fun experience. And I started treating it from the beginning like it could be a business. And uh, not long after, it, it did become one. That's wonderful. I mean, it's cool to see you know, this industry that a lot of people don't necessarily know a lot about and being the radio and broadcasting space. Um, obviously we think about it from time to time, but more, more predominantly in the most recent years, we think of the internet space. And so radio sometimes feels a little old school, but it's interesting to see how you've been able to take, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. It's a direct parallel, uh, yeah. you know, it's just over on a different channel. So that's amazing that you've been able to kind of pivot that and make that so so uh, so strategic with the tools today. Um, I'm curious, like, what do you feel like you've brought the most from your former career in radio over to the live streaming space that a lot of people today that are just jumping directly into live streaming may not uh, know or may not have that skill to incorporate. Well, I, I mean, some of it are, are things that I do almost without thinking at this point, but a lot of it has to do with how you manage the show, how you conduct an interview, how you get a sense of, is this a topic to, you know, kind of push on the gas more? Is this a place to take your foot off the gas? Is this a place to change directions? What do you do? I'm very comfortable when things go wrong, when tech doesn't work, when a guest drops off. Um, if I ask to come on a show on the spur of the moment, uh, I'm very comfortable with those kind of things because of the broadcasting side. So most people, as you said, come to this from either social media marketing or tech. In fact, in the beginning, most people came from tech because if you didn't understand tech, you really couldn't do it. Now the tech has become so democratized that practically anybody with a computer and an internet connection can get on here and do this but there are certain techniques for hosting shows for carrying on a conversation for being comfortable on the microphone i can't say i've ever become like totally focused on the camera right i don't always look at the camera i was wondering um, I, I was curious like how that transition was from like just being audio to with you know, live streaming now, it's so much of video and audio together. Yeah. Has that been a- It's definitely transition? different when, when for so long you didn't really have to think about what you look like and you could really create a, an impression with your voice. And if you wanted to contort your body to say something or you wanted to yell to somebody in the background, you could turn off your, like now everything's right in front of the camera. And oh, while I'm getting better at looking at the camera, I certainly wasn't somebody who was like zoned in on the camera. I focused on the content and 
The good thing for me is that the content in live streaming is primarily in the audio. It's mostly in the conversation. Yeah. Uh, the video is an added bonus. And I think it's kind of fun to see how people are set up and where they're coming to you from and, and, and look at the video. But obviously, it's the audio, which is why you can take this video recording that we're doing and you can make a podcast episode out of it. I think if we were just shooting video or shooting still frames, you you couldn't, you you know, you couldn't take a pod, make a pod. Obviously, I mean it's obvious, right? Right. You just you have to have that conversation, and you almost have to, when you're making a podcast out of it, think about the podcast audience or the audio audience first, because anything else they're not picking up. So you have to be a little more descriptive. So things like that as well, that comes from my sports background. I'd say the other thing is um, just the experience with interviewing people mm -hmm. and being able to pretty much grab anybody and do an interview, even if I don't have any really idea who they are or anything. Yeah. So it, it speeds the time to market for me. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't prepare, but again, it's, I'm I, a lot of it's in listening and getting a sense of what the person's about and where the, where's the news angle in this yeah. and where's the, where's the entertainment angle and, and going after that. That's wonderful. And you've been doing this for a while. Have you had any things that you've seen of like tangible examples of how you've maybe innovated since when you first started doing live streaming, any tips or things that you've picked up over the, over the years? I think the biggest thing was back in 2017, um, it became apparent to me that ultimately, if you were going to do this and make a business out of it, you had to learn how to talk about products and services, whether it's your own, whether it's somebody else's, you had to learn how to sell on live video, that that, that was going to be the future mm -hmm. of, of live video if you wanted to monetize it. And so over the years, I've been working with different brands, uh, but I also started a show before I even did that. I started a show called live stream deals. And that show was all about having three or four reps, CEOs, marketing people, whatever from different products on, and each one would be a segment. And I'd ask them questions about their product and the industry and their area of expertise. But at the end there was a call to action and, and, I have a web, I had a website, I still have a website for it, but I don't really use it anymore. But I, I, there was everything in place so that when Amazon Live, let's say came along yeah. and I, I was on there early, I, I felt exactly at home, you know, because, okay, I've been doing this. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I've, I've been out front. I haven't been doing it nearly as much as a lot of the other people that we, hung out with at PodFest and yeah. BigFest. Um, they've been much more active than I have over the last couple of years, but it was pretty cool to hear how many of them like came up to me and like, hey, I got started because of your, your video on how to do it. That's so, great. Yeah, so that was, I, I would say that was probably the biggest thing is being ahead of the curve on the, on the selling part of it. Yeah, well, and I love that you focused like from the get-go of like, how, how am I gonna make this a business? You know, right. how am I going to make this more than just a fun hobby that I enjoy doing, but may not make me a lot of money. So uh, having that strategic focus, are there any things that you did from the beginning to help you set, you know, set that your show or just the brand up for success? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I started Livestream Universe. So mm -hmm. I started a, I picked a name that I, sounded sort of bigger than just a guy sitting here in the dark trying sure. to figure out how to plug in his computer. Um, I also, which helped me, I started out with the idea that I wasn't going to do shows. I wasn't going to be mm -hmm. on camera. I was actually going to sort of cover what was going on. I'm sort of like a social media examiner for live streaming. I was going to yeah. write articles about it, highlight the people who were doing it. Um, so I quickly built up a Twitter account around it and, you know, had a, had a website that featured a lot of people and I was highlighting what other people were doing long before I actually, it's not that long because it all happened quickly, but right. before I actually hosted a show, I already 
was known by a lot of people and looked to as somebody who was on their side because I was promoting their shows and I was showing up and supporting them in the chat and, you know, tweeting out that they were live and, and so forth. And then I started coming on a little bit as a call in uh, on Blab back in the day, uh, a, a platform that made it very easy to do that. It was sort of very community focused. And from there, that's when um, I eventually said, well, you know, I, I wasn't going to host the show, but it might help promote the website. Right. And so it's like, OK, I could justify it then. Yeah. And so I started doing that. And once I hosted the first show, it was obvious that like, OK, this is where I'm going to make an impact. The other stuff was nice. We're back. We're back in the game. We're we're <laughs> a broadcaster now, not a, you know, not somebody on the sideline right. capturing whatever. So, I mean, I continued to promote people. I did, again, I did everything business-like, even though at this point it's a hobby. So I had a time, a day, I went live. I had a whole workflow, something like I was organized like you're organized. And I had a system and I had a, system. you know, I had a whole <laughs> thing. Um, I, yeah. and, and in the first, the first year, I think, I booked out all my guests like nine months ahead or something crazy. Uh, but so that helped me being very consistent, promoting other people. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously having the experience as a host, I think people were pretty surprised who might have known me from social media or whatever that, oh, well, this is kind of a different level of doing this. Yeah. I mean, you do have a different level, I will say, like compared to some of the other folks out there, there's there's definitely your broadcast background, the systems, whether you feel confident in them or not, it shines through in what comes on the, the public facing side of the, the final product. So, um, and, and just being somebody on, who's been a guest on your show as a, you know, on the live stream, you do have a good process in place. From my end of things, like you've got your systems down really well. I mean, from like pre-production to like letting us know as a guest, what information we need to do, sound checks, uh, the whole flow of everything was really, at least on the, the times that I've come on your show, you had it down. You knew when, when a conversation needed to be dropped to stay on task. You were really good about keeping the, the flow going between the multiple panelists um, you know, everything just seemed to have, it wasn't necessarily over the top, but it did seem like you had a nice system. Um, and I know that you use a few tools to help you with production. Are there any of your favorite tools that you'd be willing to share with folks? Yeah. I mean, um, stream is what I use to produce the show. Um, I, I think it's a really stable tool and it's really easy to get guests on and, and just, keeps it simple, keeps it clean. You can do some some text and graphics and things. But for that show, I really want it to be very clean and and really focus on, on the conversation. Uh, before that, I used Wirecast for some of my stuff. And then I, I, I mean, before that, I used BeLive. And, you know, I've used a bunch of different tools. I'm playing around with Ecamm a lot now, okay. Wave.video. There's a lot of good tools out there. But understand like it's not about the tools when i when i was the first couple years that i was doing this i literally bought a, like a 50 dollar microphone and plugged it in usb to my macbook and i used the built-in camera i had no idea about lighting so i was kind of sitting in the dark my background was two doors behind me um and so it was all based on the content and then over time, I've gradually brought the level up. First, I started getting pro audio gear, and then I got better camera and lighting and so forth. And, you know, there's you can always be improving. There's no perfect thing. Yeah. But my feeling was always the content should be ahead of the gear and the set and all that stuff, because otherwise you're setting yourself up for for disappointment and you're kind of putting your focus on what isn't going to sustain you long term yeah well and so many people in today's world like they're they're going to be forgiving to some extent unless the audio is just horrible or the setting is just super distracting most people are okay with um 
having some some level of imperfection as long as right. the content is is good. So, um, I mean, I couldn't get away with looking like I did in 2016, in early 2016 or something. But yeah, neither could neither would anybody else because technology is advanced and people's basic knowledge of all these things through using zoom and, and for work and all this stuff so we're at a level where the bar has risen so much that yeah. most people could really do a show with the tools that they have or maybe they get an inexpensive microphone to plug in usb or something to put on their phone if they're using their phone so that it picks up their audio a little better but other than that um i think we're we're pretty good with what we have if you had any advice for someone that was new or just getting started and they're maybe dealing with some imposter syndrome, what advice would you give them? Think about what your goals are for doing it. If your goals are, for example, to promote your business, to get new customers, you don't have to have a big audience. You don't have to uh, have a fancy set. You have to talk about what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, what people relate to and be genuinely helpful and interested in the people that show up for your live streams. And it really doesn't matter. And if you end up with a bigger audience, you're not an imposter. If you end up being good at it or people telling you it's good, that's fine. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Um, I tend to do it more broadcast style because that's my background. Some people do it webinar style. Some people do it teaching style in front of a whiteboard. Other people just hold it like it's a conversation, like they're, you know, they're holding a phone and they're sitting on their couch and they're talking to you like you're hanging. There's no, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's only what works for you and your audience or doesn't work for you. So there's no such thing as imposter syndrome with this. Or yeah, there that's... shouldn't be like, you shouldn't be. I mean, it's not like imposter syndrome. It's like a label other people put it. You shouldn't feel that. I mean, because this is all new. We're all finding our way with it. And again, it's a tool. It's not, uh, you know, an endpoint for most yeah. people. Yeah. That's such great advice. I mean, cause a lot of times you see people that have, it, it, it just looks like they've got everything figured out and you don't re always remember that there were like 20 million steps that got them to that point. And if you're just starting off, you don't necessarily have to have everything figured out. You just need to start and improve from there, you know, to, to your story, you know, obviously the tools you were using, you know, eight years ago, six years ago, were look different, completely different than what they look like. Now your, your approach towards the live streaming and your approach towards content creation is completely different. And it probably was a bunch of like tiny little steps every mm -hmm. few weeks or every few days that got you to where you're at now versus like having it all figured out from the start. Yeah. And I mean, even for somebody like myself coming from broadcasting, this is still a unique and different medium. Um, first of all, we talked about it. There was no video when I was doing radio. Right. But there also, while there was a live audience, there was absolutely no feedback and no idea of what the audience was thinking or wanted me to discuss or was liking or not liking. Now you're dealing with a live chat. So you have real time feedback. Um, you can bring in questions and make people part of the show. And, and that's the, the differentiator is that interactivity. I yeah. mean, that's that's the advantage of live stream. And while a lot of times I'm more in like a podcast mode or mm -hmm. the focus is on the show and then I go to the chat more like let's take a break and go to the chat or I will just pull in a question or two rather than, you know, read every comment. Um, it depends on what I'm doing. There are other times where I'm just trying to, um, share something with people or learn from other people. And I'll just go on and talk to people. It won't, there will be no show structure whatsoever. Yeah. I'll just talk to the people in the chat. And I think for brands, they've got to find what works for them. Some may find that doing a show works. Other may find that, that it's, really answering the questions and providing help to their users and potential customers is where the value is. Um, and it's where you're demonstrating what you can do and how you help people and what the value of your product is. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's also the value of the entertainment and the, you know, putting something on that people enjoy watching and want to come back for. 
Yeah. It, it, there's so many different ways to do it. And I, I think, like I say, the worst thing you can do is go out and just buy a bunch of expensive gear and try and look like you're a YouTuber and get all that, you know, the just that style thing down and then find out you don't have the content yet. Or you find out that the kind of content you thought you were going to be good at or enjoy isn't what you're good at and enjoy and isn't what your audience is responding to. And so now you've got a setup for one kind of content and you really want to do something totally different or need yeah. to do something totally different. So there's, there's another sort of this, get that content first. If you take yeah. one thing away from everything I've said, the content comes first, then you build your, your tech and your visual and, and all that stuff around it. That's such a good point because I've seen so many people that they build like the fancy studio in location and then they realize that they actually need like more of a transportable, you know, you know, go with you, I'm blanking on the word, but you know, take it with you right. type of studio that they can go and they want to do stuff live at events or out and about and they're really not set up to do that well. So, um, so I, it is, it is a good point. It's similar. I think about this a lot when I, um, when you, while you were talking, it made me think of when people go to declutter and organize their home <laughs> and they go out to target or the container store and they spend hundreds of dollars buying these amazing organizers, you know, boxes and baskets and all the systems. And then they get home and then they start sorting through their stuff. And there's so many experts out there that are like, no, 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 sort your stuff first, figure right. out where things are going to go and then go buy the organizers to help you out. So it's Other, kind of the same Otherwise thing. you have a big container sitting in the corner because you don't have any place to put it. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and the it, whole clutter. It only fits thing. half your gear anyway that you are, you could say. Yeah, but you know, you don't buy the the boxes to fit, you know, and put your get your equipment to fit the boxes. You get the you figure out what your content is and then you go get the boxes you need. You know, in this case, figure out what the content of your show is and then go get the equipment you need as you know what you need. Right. You don't buy the furniture until you've measured the room. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man. So Ross, you've, you've worked on a few really fun projects in recent years. Um, do you have any personal wins that you'd love to kind of share with the group, uh, about? Sure. Well, I'd have to say the I'd have to say the book, the books are a win. Um, the two books that I published in the last year, uh, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know if anybody would read it or be interested and, and they've both done really well. And, um, the cool, one of the cool things was that my peers and friends are, have all been a part of it. Um, you've been in, in, in both editions, which yeah. I really appreciate. And, and so it's been a real fun thing to share with, uh, with the community. The other thing that, um, I've really enjoyed was, uh, being a part of StreamYard as it grew. I, I was a show mm -hmm. host for StreamYard and also did a lot of, outreach to different communities. Um, I got on board with StreamYard early on and I really was there from when from then through when they grew and and were ultimately acquired by by Hopin. Yeah. And I just being able to see how people responded to the content that I was doing, the shows, and um you know, realizing the network that like I I, it really like everything I've done over the years kind of came together mm -hmm. uh, during that time from the hosting to, you know, the network of people that I built in podcasting and YouTube and um, the different communities that I'm part of online and um, the credibility that I think people had invested in, in me as far as a resource, like if Ross is using this, I should try it. And so I might not have the biggest in audience, but I kind of influenced the influencers who look to me and go, well, if he's using that and he had me on my show and it went well, mm -hmm. let me try StreamYard. And then they try StreamYard. And now their community is, is all learning about it. Everybody in their Facebook group or subscribe to their YouTube channel. And it just really took off. And I just love doing that show every every week that I was doing for StreamYard. So 
Yeah, that I think that was a pretty pretty big win. Um, they ended up selling selling the company for uh, a nice <laughs> a nice amount, and uh, you know now it's part of part of Hoppet. That's great. Well, and yeah, it was fun on my end just being part of your book. Um, I think it's a really great strategy to just you from a book strategic marketing standpoint you by having so many people involved you really essentially created a huge network of raving fans for your book even before it came out uh yeah. by having so many people involved so uh that so was, you're ready you're ready for volume three uh, and whenever you are <laughs> I mean, I did a similar thing. I, I, I interviewed about 15 people for my book, uh, recorded all the episodes as podcasts, a podcast series. But then I had this, you know, kind of uh, not VIP, but kind of a VIP more like inner circle launch team, if you will, of people mm -hmm. who were more excited about my book simply because they were featured in it, you know? Right. And then I had my whole other like main launch team that you know, some of them were people like my cousins that they don't work in marketing. They would never <laughs> buy a marketing book, but they joined my launch team because they care about me. Um, so essentially like what you've built is you just built a really big inner circle um, for both of these books and both of these editions. So I just, I, th I thought it was really smart how you, how you went about it. And, you know, it, even that too, like you had a, a great system for just gathering the information, featuring you know, each person giving back the love. I think that's one of the other things I think about when I think about you, Ross, is you are really good at putting other people in the spotlight. And as a result, people get to know you as well. So um, it, I think it's a, a really great tool, um, whether you do it strategically or not. I think it's a great, great uh, just marketing tactic for a brand to really lift others up. So you do, you do that very well. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a strategic element to it, but I also enjoy it. So that's, it's not that's a very evident. I'm, I'm not keeping, keeping score for the most part. I mean, if I, if I help somebody Please. 10 times and there's no, never any reception, yeah. I might say, why am I putting this person front sure. and center? Um, but in general, I, I just enjoy it. And I, I think it helps me a lot for promoting shows because, it's one thing to say I'm having such and such person on as a guest, but unless that person is world famous, it really doesn't mean that much to the audience. So it becomes about understanding what that person can bring to the show. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, now it becomes very easy to promote the show and promote that person because you understand what value they bring, what they're good at, where their strengths are, what makes them different from every other guest and too many people really just promote the guest or the topic, but they don't look at what the guest is coming to speak to or mm -hmm. what talent. And that goes also in the show into like how you introduce the guest and how you promote what they do. And so there's, there's a whole thing to it that I think a lot of people don't, don't, don't think about. Well, you know, I mean, I, I see that 100% just in the, just the in-person interactions that we had or that I saw you having at PodFest. Uh, we, Ross and I were both together at a conference back in May and, you know, just seeing the, the meetups and the relationships that are built in person that, you know, you've had these relationships for years online and some of them Maybe that's the first time you've met in person. Um, maybe it's the fifth or sixth time right. you've been in person. Um, but the power of just that genuine connection versus just seeing somebody as a transaction for being a guest on a show. Um, you know, it, it, your your content is really set out for genuine connection, um, and I think that's a, a big differentiator. I, thank you. And, and you know, what's funny is that from doing the predictions now for seven years and the two books and having people on my show and, and all that, I can introduce almost anybody without their bio. So if I'm a guest on a show and somebody's asked about like, yeah. you know, tell us about yourself and they're like, ah, no, I don't like to talk about myself. I'll, I'll jump in, You'll jump and, in. <laughs> and I'll do their, their intro as though I had an <laughs> well, that speaks, I think, very highly to the radio broadcast piece where you like, you have to be quick, 
quick on your feet. Right. You know, just pivot and jump in. You know, there's no, you can't have dead airspace. You know, you just can't have that. And if you stumble in any way, you pick back up and you keep going. So I think that's, that's cool. Um, have you ever done any improv training? Um, not really. Okay. I, I just was I took curious. A, I think I took some sort of course that maybe had a day of it or something like okay. a, a 20 minutes or 40 minute exercise sure. a long time ago. So really I haven't. I mean, okay. It's really just been real life improv by being on live streaming is really. Yeah. And being yeah. on radio. I mean, yeah. I, I was pretty shy as a kid. I mean, it wasn't until mm-hmm. I got into radio that I got used to. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I was used to conversations and things, but it was like, this is definitely something that I just took to as soon as I got into radio, it just came to like, it's like, okay, I found something where yeah, you know, it clicked. Like, I'm not held back in by anything, you know, That's it's like, cool. okay, let's go. <laughs> That's really fun. I mean, I just, I love hearing that because there are certain things like once I got into doing social media, I was like, oh yeah, this is what I like doing. This is the content curation and creation. Like this, I, I can see exactly what, what the path forward is. Um, and prior to that career wise, I hadn't felt that click. So it's, it's fun to hear when other people find something that is a good fit. Uh, yeah. I, I think I enjoy doing the same kind of stuff as far as like writing about what people are doing well and stuff. When I work for, uh, you know, I worked for newspapers and been, you know, wrote for the town newspaper as a teenager and things like that. And, you know, even as a, as a print journalist in my early years or whatever, I never really liked to cover like the negative, like when you're doing a feature on somebody and then you got to bring the bad stuff in. And it's like, you know, I'd really rather, you know, maybe I should look into PR Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I, I really like highlighting what the people are doing well and being able to write about what made them unique and their skills and things. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, in, in, in radio, if you're covering something, you have to be, yeah, you know, you should be straight with it. I'm not saying every journalist is straight with it. Um, but as a, you know, as a commentator and as somebody, ho- a show host, you have a certain latitude and I'm not afraid to criticize or, you know, point out the negatives. I think you have to do that to be yeah. honest, but I, I think it also helps if you're able to understand what makes people good at what they do and what makes them tick and what's yeah. unique. And then you have more leeway and more credibility if you do have to criticize somebody. Yeah, man. It's, it's such an interesting world <laughs> when you're in this live space and working with real people. So it is, I don't know how everybody does it who doesn't have some sort of media background. I mean, there's so many places you could trip up. There's so many things that you know, like social media came naturally to me from the it's kind of the newspaper yeah. side, but also from the, the radio side. Um, I kind of had to be like, stop writing like a journalist. You don't have to put mm-hmm. every fact and date in here. You know, this is so dry or whatever, like um, <laughs> some of my tweets in the beginning. Um, and it's still to some extent, like, it's like, I'm you're, looking you're at a, it like you're a recovering journalist. Huh? Yeah, right, right. Like, I, it's like, Oh, just tease it with a simple question and throw the post up there. Like, yeah, you, know, you don't have to say everybody's name and their title and you know, <laughs> their yep. company and all that stuff. Um, but I'm getting better at it. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or I'm bringing a little bit of the other side over. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I, I picture my own story and I mean, I jumped into this with essentially no marketing background back in the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, my knowledge was design and the fact that I knew how to use Facebook and (laughs) that's what got me my, my first gig as a social media manager. Um, and then from there, you just kind of pick it up. You know, you've got certain, certain experiences pop up where you have to deal with crisis management on something, or you make a mistake and you realize, Oh, I, it really shouldn't have said that, like that's going right. to, you know, tick people off or you see things evolve, you know, 10 years ago, certain things would not have been, you know, an opportunity for people to chew their heads off. And nowadays it's like, you make, you say one thing, you know, it's going to be a whole string of comments full of all the Karens in the world coming out of the crack. 
you know, <laughs> that didn't happen as much 10 years ago. You know, you could make comments on public posts without worrying about somebody chewing your head off um, as much. Uh, nowadays, there's certain things where you're like, I, it's not even worth commenting on. I, no. I didn't get on Facebook until the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. And that was the last social network I didn't want to get that I joined. I didn't. Yeah. Want to, but like it wasn't until the beginning of 2012 that I even did any social. And then by the end of 2012, I was on everything and anything except for Facebook. And finally, mm -hmm. like kicking and screaming, I got on Facebook. But I made a deal with myself that I was never going to do any politics on mm -hmm. Facebook. And for now, going on 10 years, I've kept to it. And yeah it's so hard when things get going and you see somebody you like they're just bullying people with a an opinion that's not based on anything and you want to sort of step in and say yeah. something you're like nothing good for me will come from this right and probably nothing good for the people that are fans or friends or whatever are going to come from come from this either because at the end of the day I don't like it. I don't like the way things are like, I don't like the whole you're canceled. If you say something that, you know, uh, what do I call it? I, I used to call it the creative misinterpretation mm. where, you know, somebody was trying to say it was saying one thing, but you take those words and you attribute a different meaning to them. Yeah. And then you cast that person in a really bad light. Yeah. And that's kind of what, what I see that it just, it, it just it's ruining any sort of civil civic discourse or whatever on on social media because that's what people live for and the other thing they live for seems to be not to really advocate for something but to say that i'm better than people who have a different view of things mm -hmm. i'm gonna own them i'm gonna show them like if you don't think of this then you're not that or whatever and i'm like you know what i'm not even gonna go there yeah um, I, I'm you with know. you. I, I've got certain rules of like, there's certain happy things Thanksgiving. And that's about, <laughs> that's about, you know, from mm -hmm. the real world and me, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's certain limits that I think a lot of us put on, on social media and rightly so, you know, cause then we see all the, the people that clearly don't have any boundaries that they put for themselves and you know, I do think like if you're representing an organization or you're an influencer in an industry or something, don't you want to represent everybody in that? Like, don't you have a responsibility to mm -hmm. everybody, not just people who think like you do or have the same social well, political goals? It's, and, and isn't that also yeah. good for your business and good for the organization? But it, it sort of seems like I don't know. It just seems like you should be for everybody and, and not people have to have some sort of litmus test of, you know, mm -hmm. something that doesn't have anything to do with live streaming shouldn't determine whether I help you or you help me or we work together or not work together. Yeah. And so it's probably better that some of that stuff is left unsaid until we get to a point where we can discuss these things the same way we discuss sports or food or <laughs> movies or well whatever. and you and i think that way but sometimes people forget that they are representing a brand right they rep they forget that they are and a lot of times the reality is everyone's representing brand whether they realize it or not they a lot of times people forget that they have their own personal brand um even if they work for a corporation or they work for someone else they're not a, an entrepreneur they're they're not a business owner themselves they're not an influencer everybody has a personal brand. And I think that's the right. piece that a lot of people forget. Whereas people like you and me, we're very aware of like, hey, how I come across is really important. It really matters if I get into a civil discord or, you know, a, you know, huge argument on a comment string, that's going to change how people perceive my company or my brand. Right. You know, right. we have that, that filter we put on everything. A lot of people don't. So it's been interesting to see how things have evolved over the years. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of companies want to feel like they have to be taking stands on things that they really have no expertise in. Yep. And, you know, then it's also gets caught up in, well, does that really what they believe or does that better align with their financial interests? Yeah. And things like that. Um, but that's why I, I, again, I like, I have a hard rule on it because if I, 
do if I put something up on something, then then there's always going to be a question. How come he didn't put something up about this issue or why mm -hmm. didn't he have a statement about this or why didn't his business? Why didn't Livestream Universe take a stand like so yeah. if I never, if, you know, if I'm Switzerland on everything mm -hmm. or whatever, then, you know, nobody can accuse me of uh, I mean, they could still say you should be doing this or that, but it, at least there's no expectation that okay, you spoke on this, but you didn't speak on that, yeah. or you care about this, but you don't care about that. Um, I care about things more than people know, but they don't need to know what I care about or where. Exactly. They, they need to know that I'm on their side if they're trying to get better at live streaming or trying to get better <laughs> at doing a podcast yeah. or you know, have something in that area. And it shouldn't matter what their views are on you know, whatever the, the hot button issues of the day are. Exactly. Exactly. So if you were to give somebody some advice today about, you know, as somebody who supports people doing live streaming and podcasting and all this audio visual stuff online today, if you wanted to give somebody one piece of advice, one takeaway from today's conversation of how they could go after their next win in marketing, uh, what would you tell them? Uh, I would say if you're doing live streaming, don't get hung up on you have to be on social media all the time. Mm -hmm. Look for other ways, like use social media for discovery, use social media to relate to your audience, but start to think about what other places that I can live stream because organic reach isn't very good right now. So you can do everything right. You can be really good. You can promote, you can do all those things. And if the algorithms aren't at this point favoring small business owners and create solo creators who are trying to build an audience, you can only go so far. So think about moving that audience to other platforms and establishing yourself. So think about developing the skill set to sell on Amazon Live. Whether or not you make money on Amazon Live, getting into that arena will then give you the experience so when other sales platforms come online and other big brands decide that they want to have have that type of live streaming you'll be ready for that mm -hmm. and the other thing is think about how you can monetize your knowledge and expertise um, so instead of trying to reach thousands and hundreds of thousands of people Think about how can you serve a small but very loyal, interested audience that wants to learn from you, wants access to you, wants a special episode, and is willing to pay for a course, a mastermind, a membership group. Uh, yeah. You know, so think about that as where the opportunities may lie. They may lie well off of the platforms that we've become conditioned to distribute mm -hmm. our content. And the other thing, although it's dropping, interest right now is dropping in virtual events, I still think that there's a lot of opportunity in virtual events that's going to come forward. Just like podcast had its little spurt and then it yeah. went away. And then, you know, now there's a nobody that doesn't have a podcast if they're right. <laughs> they're alive online, right? I, I do think that there's still gonna be a big opportunity for virtual events. Um, the first go around, didn't make the impact that people had hoped they would for a lot of them. A lot of them weren't that good. A lot of them were still kind of doing things the old way we did social. But I think there's a future for virtual events that's going to be pretty, that could be, could be a potentially strong place to bring your audience where you have a lot of attention on what you're doing. Yeah. And you can, you can monetize as well. And it's also a forum for highlighting other people and making them a part of your ecosystem, sponsorships, all sorts of things. So I would say selling is one thing, Sell, selling live streams, learn Amazon Live, learn that, yeah. that, that area. Think about what type of paid content you can create for a small segment of your potential audience. And, and then don't forget about virtual events as another way to get people off of social media and bring them into your world and and really have them have a more immersive experience and a bigger win for everybody 
That's wonderful. Well, Ross, you have clearly shared uh, a huge wealth of information today. I think uh, I've got some ideas myself about how to improve my own efforts in terms of my audio and my video content and, you know, maybe, maybe dabbling in some more live, live streaming <laughs> stuff. Uh, gotta, gotta get a, get some, some more logistics in place for that. It's hard when you've got a two-year-old running around your house. Um, <laughs> but well, I'm, uh, I'm here if you have any questions, if I can help at all. <laughs> you know, I'll <laughs> you up. <laughs> um, before we head off here, sure. if people want to get more from Ross Brand, where can they go online to find out more from you? Livestreamuniverse.com is the website. Um, my podcast is called Recordings, uh, rossbrandrecordings.com. And of course, you can find me on Amazon Live. My channel is rossbrand.live. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Ross, for sharing today and just being the inspiration day in and day out for high quality live streaming. Well, thanks for having me. I love what you're doing. And uh, it was an honor to have you in, in both of the books and uh, being a big part of this new panel discussion show that, I, that I've started. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you liked what you just heard, please hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes. And while you're at it, go ahead and leave us a review. That not only helps us out, but it helps others discover great interviews just like this one.